Okay, hi everyone, good morning. Um, today we have a guest lecture uh, and I'm very thrilled to introduce Ohad Shamil. Uh, Ohad is a professor at uh, the CS and uh, Mathematics Department and he's also affiliated with the AI Center and he's done some really exciting work on uh, theory of deep learning. Uh, and today he's gonna tell us all about it or at least part of it. <laughs> Ohad, please take it off. Thank you for joining this us. This is some part. Uh, sure, so thanks, uh, Tali, for the introduction, for inviting me. Um, feel free to stop me anytime if uh, you have uh, any question. Um, okay, so uh, theory of deep learning. Uh, so first of all, for this audience, I guess I don't have to explain what's uh, deep learning and uh, neural networks. We have neurons connected to each other and Basically, we're talking about choosing some network architecture, optimizing the weights based on training data, uh, and then using the network to predict. Uh, I probably don't uh, also have to tell you about all the successes of deep learning over the past decade. Uh, I know things like image recognition, speech recognition, automated translation, um, protein folding recently, and we've been playing uh, various games. Um, so it really led to, you know, pretty dramatic uh, improvements on um, state of the art across many, many different uh, applications, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, there aren't also some challenges. Um, so for example, uh, so far deep learning has mostly been good, uh, or at least especially good in situations where um, you basically wanted to perform well most of the time. You know, like if I um, use deep learning as some component in a search, um, then, you know, it, it's fine usually that um, I query for something and once in a while I don't get exactly uh, what I want, no harm done. Um, but the problem is that for some applications, as we'll see later, this um, is not good enough. Like we really, it's really important for us that, uh, you know, the system will perform uh, reliably well and it won't fail in all kinds of weird ways. And that's actually not uh, the case at least yet, as of now. So the systems that we currently have, uh, they were great in most cases, uh, most of the time, uh, but sometimes it can also be brittle and fail in all kinds of weird and uh, unpredictable ways. Um, like one way to look at it, which I like, is uh, this uh, quote uh, by Pedro Domingos that, you know, people worry that uh, computers and machine learning and AI uh, will get too smart and take over the world. Uh, but the real problem is that they're, currently too stupid and they've already taken over the world. Um, so we use them, uh, so, so it's often being used even in um, uh, you know, pretty crucial applications, kind of ignoring the fact that it, it can actually behave pretty stupidly sometimes. Um, so just to give a few examples and you know, warning, I'm subjective here and you know, I'm just conveying my own opinion. So I think uh, self-driving is like one good example of this. Uh, so self-driving is like two or three years away from uh, uh, being a reality. And it's been like that for quite some uh, time now. Um, and you know, it could still very well be that you know, self-driving uh, will come shortly and we won't need to drive cars ourselves, but um, it should be realized that this turns out to be, um, I think, a much more difficult uh, application area than what many people initially uh, suspected. Um, and one of the big problems is it, it's not hard to make an autonomous car operate by itself most of the time. But the problem are those weird corner cases or unexpected things that happen, in which case, these systems can often, uh, uh, can sometimes at least uh, fail. Uh, in some rare cases, even with, you know, pretty um, uh, bad results. So there was this famous uh, story about two years ago where an Uber autonomous car uh, actually killed uh, a pedestrian crossing uh, the road. It just didn't see uh, that uh, pedestrian, although a human driver uh, probably would have. Uh, of course, there was a human, uh, uh, you know, safety uh, operator in the car, but uh, 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 you know, she didn't pay attention. So uh, that that case was ended with fatality. Uh, okay, so that's like an extreme case, but it's also 
um, it happens in many cases that these uh, systems just don't behave in um, you know, a predictable way or uh, in the way that you want. And you, know, you can go online on YouTube or other places and you can see many, many examples of this. So this is just like uh, one example uh, where there is a certain um, place in a road, in a highway uh, somewhere in the US where autonomous vehicles just tend to uh, stop uh, uh, in the middle of the highway. And why is that? Because uh, if you notice, there is this uh, store over here, which has this big stop sign on it. Now, of course, it's not a real traffic sign and no human will actually stop because it's seeing this stop sign, but uh, uh, autonomous vehicles can think uh, based on, you know, the training data they had and um, what well, they see that, you know, if they observe this uh, kind of uh, object in the image, then they need uh, to stop. Uh, and they don't realize that this is not a real uh, traffic sign. So, I mean, of course you can fix the system to handle that, but the point is that there are many, 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 many unpredictable and weird things that can happen maybe rarely on the road, but um, where you know it can really make these uh, systems uh, behave in a weird way, at least currently. Um, okay, so th this is like in the context of autonomous cars, but you can also see it in other uh, application areas. So for example, some of you might remember a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of excitement about uh, uh, deep learning systems um, uh, analyzing medical images at a level comparable or even superior to human experts. There was talk about you know, how radiologists might be, you know, soon be out of a job. Um, and we're now several years later and radiologists uh, still all have their uh, jobs. So you know what uh, went wrong. Um, so um, just like uh, to give uh, one example. So this is actually uh, something that uh, Andrew Ng, which was one of the people who uh, you know, developed these systems. He was asked about this recently at a conference and he gave, I think a very nice and candid answer. So basically what he said is that uh, when they went and collected training data, it was from a specific hospital in Stanford. Um, and you know, when they trained and tested on the data from that hospital, then you could develop uh, deep learning systems that performed as well as human radiologists, uh, at least in spotting certain conditions. But it turned out that when you actually now try to uh, develop a um, model that you can actually apply in the real world, then you know, you can't, uh, you want it to work not just on uh, data from one hospital, you want it to work with data and images taken from many different hospitals. And it turns out that when you take the same model, okay, same AI uh, system to a different hospital, maybe an older hospital with an older machine where the images look a little bit different, uh, and where the imaging protocol is a little bit different, then uh, that causes the data to change a little bit in a way that a human radiologist will have no problem handling. But um, at least these kind of AI systems that were developed uh, uh, just don't work uh, as well. Okay, so uh, I concluded that even though at a moment in time on a specific data set, we can show this works, the clinical reality is that these models still need a lot of work to reach uh, production. Okay, so of course that doesn't mean that uh, radiologists might not, might, you know, maybe they'll still be out of, out of a job in a few years, but at least currently the level of riddleness of these systems is still not uh, good enough to compete with uh, a human. Um, another example, which I'm, I'm assuming you already heard about in your course is the adversarial examples, uh, so, you know, just to give an example of this in the context of the previous slide. So I can take an image where the system very confidently uh, says what's the object in the image. So here it's like an image of uh, you know some skin growth and you need to decide, uh, decide if it's a benign uh, growth or, a, uh, or a, like an actual cancer or tumor. Um, and you can very easily take the image uh, that say the system says it's uh, benign and then add just a little, little bit of noise to the pixels, uh, so little that uh, we as humans don't even see the difference. 
but you get an image where the system now very confidently uh, claims that it's a tumor that uh, has to be removed. So again, this is the kind of brittleness that we don't see um, with uh, humans and in certain uh, critical applications can uh, be very problematic. We don't want systems uh, to fail in these kinds of ways. Um, okay, so that's like kind of one problem with uh, deep learning, um, the current state of the art with deep learning, uh, but there are also other issues. So for example, even in the areas where they work well, we don't really have any good understanding of why it works or uh, when it uh, works. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like rules of thumb and heuristics uh, that tell us, you know, if I use this uh, hyper network of this size, then this is good for this application. But uh, it's not that we really understand, you know, why this layer has to be of this uh, a width or why we need to do this kind of connection or a different type of connection. Um, you know, at least not in any kind of a uh, rigorous uh, way. It's basically a result of a lot of uh, trial and error and uh, student uh, gradient descent. And, um, uh, but, you know, it's not really, it's not really something that currently comes from some principled understanding of uh, these systems. Now, a valid objection to this is that, you know, it, it, heuristics brought us so far with deep learning. I mean, what's so, uh, what's, wrong with heuristics? Why can't we just continue relying on heuristics? Um, so like at least one thing you can uh, um, argue about it is that at least in the long run, maybe heuristics can only get you so far. You know, still the search space of all possible network architectures and all possible optimization methods is uh, huge. And just doing trial and error and doing like random search in this huge space um, might, uh, um, it, you know, it might be difficult to continue with the kind of uh, improvement rates that we've been seeing so far. So, you know, at some point, the law of diminishing returns uh, will set in, and it might get more and more difficult to get the same kind of uh, um, performance uh, improvements. Um, maybe to give an analogy, um, you know, at least in the long run, trying to develop deep learning without uh, any theoretical understanding. It's maybe it's a bit like trying to design and develop airplanes uh, without any understanding of aerodynamics. Um, so it is possible. So actually a lot of the early developments in uh, uh, you know, heavier than air uh, aircrafts and such in the 19th century was done without the theoretical understanding of aerodynamics. But uh, nowadays it's of course a crucial tool uh, if you want to develop you know, really good uh, airplanes. Um, and if we would have developed uh, airplanes without aerodynamics, maybe we would get an airplane, but it will probably be, um, it won't perform as good as a uh, modern airplanes. And also it would have probably taken much longer, uh, require uh, much more uh, resources. Um, now it's not that, you know, even today, uh, it's not that, you know, if you want to develop an airplane, you rely just on theoretical, on the theory of aerodynamics, and you just, you know, uh, design it uh, uh, on a piece of paper. You still need to do a lot of experimentation, uh, simulations, wind tunnels, and so on. But you do have some theory that at least guides you, tells you what are the kind of things that could work and couldn't work. Um, and uh, hopefully, we might want to have something like that for uh, deep learning as well. Okay, so uh, after this uh, uh, introduction, um, motivating why we want to try and develop theory for uh, deep learning, um, we're going to turn to the actual context of this lecture. So this is going to be kind of a broad overview and some vignettes on uh, the current research being done in context of deep learning theory. Uh, I should emphasize it's a very, very, very active field nowadays with tons of paper uh, coming out. So there is no way I can cover everything in one uh, uh, lecture or even just in uh, one course. So what I'm gonna talk about is gonna be very partial and uh, subjective. Uh, like to be honest, it's probably heavily biased towards things I worked on uh, in the past. Um, and of course, every, any opinion I state is uh, purely my own and should not be seen as like some official statement on behalf of the uh, 
uh, deep learning theory community. Um, and again, I'm reminding you, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to stop me at any time. Okay. So uh, how do we develop a theory for deep learning? How do we develop a theory for any kind of learning system? So uh, the standard way to do this is to um, look at the learning system. Uh, so ideally we want a system that will predict perfectly correctly on any example we give it uh, in the future. Of course, that's impossible. And it turns out that it's impossible for three reasons. And um, sort of looking at each of these uh, reasons uh, separately and analyzing them and trying to understand how to make them better uh, is kind of a very useful way to uh, understand learning systems in general. So what are the three sources why we can't get perfect uh, learning performance? So the first um, uh, source for suboptimal performance is what is known as approximation error. So this uh, boils down to the fact that if I take a given neural network architecture, then uh, no matter how I play around with the network weights, I cannot express any kind of uh, input output uh, uh, mapping. Okay, you can't express, you cannot express any function with a given finite uh, neural uh, network. And that already gives you some constraint. It means that at least for certain problems um, where you need a certain input output mapping, maybe your network just can't represent that mapping and that's a source for error. So that's kind of a functional or a geometric constraint. It has nothing to do with um, you know, computational resources or statistical constraints, constraints. Just, just the way the function yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. Was there a question? Okay. Um, so that's approximation error. The second source for error is what is known as estimation error. So that's a statistical constraint and that has to do with the fact that we don't get to see the underlying distribution. We don't know exactly what are the uh, distribution of all future images that we wanna label, for example. We only have some samples, some finite sample of uh, training examples uh, to use. Um, so, that's, so that means that we cannot, so, so we might have some error just because we don't know the exact distribution. That's a statistical source of error. And finally, we have an optimization error, which is a computational constraint. It means that even if I just want to get good performance on a, a given training set, and even though there exists a combination of weights that perform well, it might be computationally difficult to find uh, that combination of weights. Uh, because when we train neural networks, it generally not, it's a non-convex uh, problem. And we are not always guaranteed to find the globally optimal uh, solution. Um, okay, so these are the three kind of main sources of uh, error in machine learning. And uh, what I'm gonna go, what we're gonna do now is sort of go um, uh, over each one and talk a little bit what kind of uh, results and challenges do we have for each in the context of uh, deep learning. Okay, so I'm gonna start with approximation error, which you can also think of as expressiveness, what um, neural, a given neural network can express. And there are various questions you can, specific questions you can ask about it. So for example, do we really need all this depth when we talk about deep learning? Do we really need neural networks with many, many layers to express whatever we want them to express? So uh, first of all, at least empirically, the answers, there's like overwhelming evidence that the answer is positive. We really need this depth. If you wanna get state of the art, uh, you know, an image recognition with the two layer network, good luck. You really need many, many layers and big networks to make this happen. Also, when you think about it, um, this depth requirement is kind of intuitive because many of the tasks on which we apply neural networks can be naturally modeled as a pipeline. So um, again, to give an example from image recognition, um, suppose I have an image, I want to create the system that uh, tells me what's in the, um, in the image. So uh, the way it was done, uh, to my understanding in the computer vision community, at least you know, a decade or two ago, 
uh, was to actually form this very explicit pipeline where, first of all, you, um, you take the image and you apply a set of certain handcrafted features. Uh, SIFT, for example, there were all kinds of other uh, methods um, which uh, sort of extract information from uh, the image. Only then on those features, you apply some standard machine learning uh, system, some kind of predictor, you know, say a support vector machine or something like that, uh, in order to give you the label. Okay, and actually a lot of uh, the papers in the computer vision community was about coming up with good features that you can then feed into um, in those predictors. Okay, so you have a pipeline, you have the image, then you process it, you extract features, then you apply uh, some predictor, linear predictor, kernel predictor, neural network, something else, and then you get uh, the answer. Uh, the pipeline was even more complicated in things like uh, translation. For example, you have some sentence in Chinese. So the way you used to uh, do it is first you had some model that parses the sentence. Uh, you know, this, the text here is the subject, here is the object. Then uh, each part was translated, say, to English. And then there was another model that combined uh, everything uh, back into an English uh, sentence. Um, and the neural networks kind of uh, did away with a lot of these paradigms. So um, in some sense, a lot of this was now, is now replaced by end-to-end -end learning. You just let the network figure out this pipeline by itself. Uh, but still, um, the fact that this seems to require a pipeline seems to necessitate depth in the network. So if the network is supposed to, to simulate this kind of pipeline, it makes sense that you know you have the first few layers, um, uh, you know, extracting features, and then the next few layers doing the uh, image recognition part, uh, and so on. It's kind of intuitive that you would need this depth to simulate this pipeline. However, it's important to realize that this is just uh, um, an intuition, right? It's not a rigorous argument. So if you try to make this rigorous, you can try and phrase this as follows. So uh, can we come up with functions uh, from, you know, real valid functions and Euclidean space, which you can express by a sufficiently deep neural network, okay, depth L with W for some reasonable values of L and W, but that if you try to approximate these functions with a shallower network, with a depth smaller than L, then you won't be able to do it, at least unless your width is very, very large and definitely much, much, much larger than uh, the width of the deep uh, network. Okay, so, so that would be kind of a formal justification for why you need the depth. You know, at least for certain input output mappings, um, if you try to express it with or approximate it with any shallow network, you won't be able to do it with a reasonably sized network. Um, and um, the thing with the width here, I mean, why I'm saying um, uh, that you know we can't do it with a small width. The, the point is that if you make the width large enough, then you can express pretty much uh, everything. So there are these uh, universal approximation results, which basically tell us that even depth uh, two networks, if they're if they can be ar arbitrarily wide, you can basically express whatever you want. But the, the width really has to be huge. It has to be like exponential in the dimension in general. So the, the question here is what you can express with networks whose width is reasonably large, you know, so polynomial in the dimension, or not exponential in the dimension. Um, is the formal question clear to everyone? Okay. Um, so uh, here's a simple example which shows uh, this kind of uh, phenomena of, you know, function that you can express with small, deep networks, but you cannot express with shallower networks unless their width is, is huge. Uh, so this is from a paper by uh, Matus Trudarski in 2016. Uh, so let's look at the following very simple function in one dimension. Um, I can write the uh, formula, but it's basically what you see here. It's a function that goes from zero to one and then back to zero as I move X from zero to one. Okay, now 
what happens when I take this function and I compose it with itself? Okay, so this function goes from zero to one back to zero. So that means that if I compose a function with itself, I really get like two images of this function. Uh, so you can either think about it for a minute or just believe me that you compose it with itself, you get these two bumps. Okay, now suppose I compose this function yet again, um, then uh, what do I get? So this function, f composed with itself, I go from zero to one back to zero, again to one, again to zero. So composing this again with f, I'm gonna get a function now with four bumps. And if I compose it again, any guesses how many bumps I'm gonna get? Okay, uh, so eight. Okay, so, and if I do it again, I'm gonna get 16. And the number of bumps basically go, grows exponentially with uh, the number of compositions I do. Okay, so what does this tell me? So, uh, first of all, uh, you should notice that the function f, this function that just goes from one back to zero, I can easily realize it with uh, basically a linear combination of two ReLU neurons. Okay, one uh, gives me the uh, up part and the second one gives me the down part. Uh, now, I can just compose, I can express the composition of this function with itself uh, k times by a depth k uh, network where the width of each layer is two. Okay, I just take that single layer expressing f and putting it one, stacking it one on top of the other. Okay, just k copies of the same layer. Also, um, as we said, uh, f composed of itself k times um, has a number of bumps or zigzags, which is exponential in k, two to the power of k minus one to be exact. Uh, and that's a function which is composed of two to the k linear pieces. And it has a structure such that you cannot approximate it well, at least with respect to uniform distribution on zero one, by any kind of piecewise linear function with much less than uh, two to the k uh, pieces. So uh, I'm not gonna give you a formal proof of this, but it should be kind of intuitive. This function goes up, down, up, down, up, down many, many times. And if I try to approximate it by a function that can change only a few times, I won't be able to approximate this function too well, okay? The final uh, piece we need here is to realize that if I take a real network of a given depth and width, uh, so it's a piecewise linear function and it can only express W to the L power uh, linear pieces. So again, I'm not gonna show you the proof, you'll need to believe me, but Basically, if the depth is not too large, the width is not too large, there are only so many linear, different linear pieces you can express, okay? So now let's take all of these observations uh, together and see what we get. So overall, we get that the function f composed with itself k times, which you can express by a depth k wave speed network, cannot be approximated by a depth L width W networks for any L and W, unless W to the L power is something like two to the K. Okay, again, this is because a depth L width W network can only express something like W to the L linear pieces. If this is much smaller than two to the K, then um, you just can't express f to the k, which has uh, two to the k linear uh, pieces. So this gives us some kind of in approximability result that if L and W are not sufficiently large, uh, we won't be able to express this function. So just to make this more concrete, let's look at a specific choice of W and L. So in particular, this theorem implies that f to the k which is expressible by a depth K width to network, a deep and narrow network. It cannot be expressed by a much shallower network, network of any depth much less than K over log K, unless the width is more than polynomial in K. Okay, so I made the depth smaller by a factor of anything more than log K, and now instead of width of two, I need width which is more than polynomial in K. 
Okay, so log k reduction in depth translate to a super polynomial blow up in the width if I want to approximate this function. What? Yes. Hi. I, I actually have a question, maybe a naive one, yes. but uh, what's the motivation of looking at a function uh, composited with itself? Like I'm thinking of like real signal in the world. Why do you want to compose a function with itself? That's a great question. And we're actually gonna get to that uh, later on. So this is just a toy example. I'm not claiming, um, well, okay, it, it has certain applications, but okay, not, real world ones. So this is mostly a toy example showing that there exists some function that has this kind of inapproximability behavior. Uh, so like the first stage um, is, you know, I'm trying to understand are there any functions which have this uh, behavior? Once we understand that, we can ask what about real world uh, functions that we actually might care about? And we'll get, get to that later on. Uh, but for now, I'm starting with just toy examples. Okay. Um, here's another simple toy example. Uh, well, maybe a little bit less uh, uh, toy, but still uh, pretty much toy. So I just look at the function x maps to x squared. Okay. So uh, with the depth to network, I can approximate this function to accuracy epsilon uh, with uh, something like one over epsilon uh, neurons. Uh, so for real network, I can never express this function exactly because it's like a smoothly changing function and for real network, you can only express piecewise linear functions. But with something like one over epsilon neurons, you can have like a, a function with a one over epsilon linear pieces, each of which epsilon, and that would approximate this function up to accuracy epsilon. Um, so this is for a shallow network. Um, but if you allow deeper network, a slightly deeper network, something like log one over epsilon, then it turns out you can um, express, approximate this function to accuracy epsilon with both depth and width log one over epsilon. So in terms of the total number of neurons, you need a much smaller uh, number of uh, neurons compared to a shallow network, okay? Uh, and just to briefly explain the idea, so, so how do you express this with log one over epsilon uh, neurons? Um, so the idea is that you use something like uh, fk, where f is this function we saw earlier, which has many, many zigzags, to um, kind of compute a bit representation of x. So x is a real number between zero and one. And fk, something like fk, which oscillates uh, two to the k times, I can use in order to extract the k bit of x, and I can do it for k equal one, two, three, and so on. So I can get the binary representation of x um, up to accuracy epsilon. So I can get the first log one over epsilon bits um, using log one over epsilon depth, okay? Now, once I have this bit representation of x, I can compute x squared, again, using just the width uh, log one over epsilon, the two layers. Um, so I just compute x squared given x, and I do it uh, with long multiplication, like the way you learned in elementary school, how to multiply uh, two numbers. Okay, I just take any pair of bits and uh, compute how much uh, the, the multiplication, and then I add it up. And that gives me x squared in bit representation. And then I take an appropriate weighted sum of this to get x squared as a real uh, number. Okay, so overall with, I'm not going into the technical details here, but overall with something like this, using just log one over epsilon many neurons, I can uh, approximate uh, this simple function to accuracy epsilon. Uh, even though, again, if you force a, a shallower network, um, then you need the weights to be polynomial in one over epsilon. Okay, so again, we have this kind of trade-off then between depth and width. Uh, uh, finally, just to mention, uh, like briefly mention another kind of family of results here. So this is, was all about situations where the depth um, scales with epsilon, or you have some parameter k. Well, what if I just want to talk about, you know, depth five versus depth three or something like that? So there as well, there are various results. 
Uh, so for example, the results saying that there exist functions and input distributions, which can be expressed by a depth three, uh, small width uh, real networks <coughs> that cannot be approximated to any constant accuracy by any depth two network, unless the width is exponential in D. So you get like separation between depth three and depth two. Um, and like the first result on these lines basically had no assumptions, but it had a pretty complicated proof. It had to do with looking at the Fourier transform uh, or the Fourier representation of the networks and uh, noticing that at least with certain carefully tailored input distributions, um, the Fourier representation of two layer networks is sparse, whereas um, uh, deeper networks have a non-sparse representation you can use this to get a result. Um, then there were other papers that required a bit more, but uh, had uh, much simpler proofs. Um, anyway, so there are, all, uh, there are a bunch of results for depth two versus three, um, but for a higher depths, it turns out that like we don't have a very good uh, results and there are also good reasons for it because it turns out that if you try to prove these separations for depths much larger than four, um, there are connections between this and various hard open problems and computational uh, complexity. Uh, so uh, probably we won't be able to show these kinds of results um, for much higher depths. Um, there are various open questions there, but I, I won't go too much into the uh, details. Um, now, uh, going back to Tali's uh, question, so the problem with these uh, uh, functions is that, you know, they, they were construction showing that there is some function that you can express with a deep network that you cannot express with a shallow network. But uh, these are usually toy functions without like any uh, reasonable connection to the real world. And moreover, they're not the kind of functions that you would really even hope to learn with standard learning methods. So for example, if you look at that zigzag function, um, f to the k with exponentially many zigzags, uh, if you try to apply gradient descent on a neural network to learn this, good luck, it's never gonna work. Um, so, but you know, what we are interested in is only functions that uh, can be efficiently learned, right? If uh, there is some function that I can never uh, learn then the fact that I can or cannot express it with a certain architecture um, is in some sense not as uh, interesting. Uh, so uh, people have noticed this issue and there are various works uh, along these lines, you know, trying to see if similar kind of depth separation issues can be shown for um, a, you know, practical functions or at least functions that you can learn with uh, gradient methods. Uh, so for example, is, this is like an example from a paper of mine from three years ago, where we try to show depth separation results. Among other things, we try to show depth separation result, results for, um, uh, you know, simple uh, functions, not like this uh, zigzags or, or weird things. So here, for example, you can show, um, you, you can see uh, results for, uh, just uh, 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 the function, which is an indicator of a unit ball. Okay, so uh, both theoretically and empirically, we could show that there is some separation here. So um, if you basically sample a lot of points uh, inside and outside the unit ball, all the points in the inside the ball you label as one, all points outside you label as zero, and then you try to apply gradient descent in some a, a neural network um, to uh, try and uh, learn this. So you can see that uh, with the depth three architecture, um, you can uh, uh, perform much better than uh, with the depth two uh, networks, even if you allow the width to become much larger. So even if I compare um, depth three width 100 network with a depth two with 800 network, and I'm trying to help the uh, depth to network by making it wider, allowing it uh, more neurons so it can express more complicated functions. Still, the depth free uh, works uh, better. And there are some theoretical arguments also why we should expect this. Uh, but 
um, we should notice that this is actually a situation where the, okay, so there is this gap between depth three and depth two, but if you look at the y-axis, it's not a huge gap. Okay, so depth three network achieve uh, like 0 0.17 mean squared error and um, depth two is like 0 0.20 something. It's not a huge uh, gap. So it's like a situation where the shallow networks perform less well, but not too badly. And uh, there are uh, researchers who are correctly trying to, uh, you know, make this into a kind of hypothesis that, you know, maybe um, deep networks work, like maybe, you know, there are functions that require uh, depth and that uh, deep networks can successfully learn them, but it works only when, uh, for problems where shallow networks to begin with are not that bad. Okay, so it's actually even a title of one of those papers, is deeper better only when shallow is good. Uh, and there are some results along these lines. So like in some sense for certain problems, if you cannot even do like even slightly better than random with a shallow network, then in some sense, uh, gradient methods are gonna fail even if you apply them on a deeper network. Okay, I won't have time to go into the details, but you know, just to kind of tease you with some um, uh, like flavor of results in this uh, area. Um, okay, so that was about uh, approximation error. Uh, next would be generalization error. Uh, but I guess, however, do you have a break usually? Or, because yeah, if so, I guess now would be probably be a good time. But, uh, sure. You tell me. Yeah, well, I typically we take a break after an hour. So, okay. So uh, let's continue. So, um, so far I talked about approximation error. Uh, now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the statistical aspect uh, of learning, which is the generalization error. <clears throat> okay, so what's kind of the classical approach to explain generalization in machine learning? Like how come I uh, train uh, some uh, a learning system and I get something that uh, would be good, not just in the training data, but also on new examples that uh, comes from a similar distribution. So uh, the formal, uh, so formally it goes as follows. So I'm uh, uh, assuming that the algorithm picks a predictor from a certain class of predictors uh, H. Uh, so say um, you fix a neural network of a given uh, architecture and you look at um, all possible uh, ways to choose weights for this network. And then we prove that this class of predictors H satisfies what is known as uniform convergence. So what it means is that with high probability over the training set, the difference between the average loss or error over the training set and the expected error with respect to uh, a future example sampled from the, trend, uh, from the same distribution. So these two quantities are close to each other and uh, they're close uniformly over every predictor in this class. Okay, so saying this a little bit differently, it's a situation where I get this training data and no matter what kind of uh, predictor I try to apply, uh, the performance on the training data and on future examples uh, is gonna be similar. Uh, if that is the case, then just going ahead and minimizing uh, the training error over the training data will also give me uh, something which is good on future examples. Because no matter which of the predictors in H I end up uh, learning, um, the training error and the test error are going to be uh, similar. Um, okay, is that clear to everyone? It's like an important basic concept here. So uh, it's important for me that people understand this. Okay. Um, okay, so when you have uniform convergence, if you can prove this property, then just doing empirical risk minimization, just trying to minimize the training error 
will end up in finding nearly optimal predictors in H in, on future examples, and you will be able to, to uh, generalize well. Uh, so this is like a classical approach, which works very well for uh, simple predictors, such as linear predictors or kernel predictors. Uh, however, when you try to apply this approach for uh, neural networks, uh, things get uh, much uh, trickier. So, and I'm gonna go a little bit into more detail on each of these bullets. So first of all, although we can prove uniform convergence bounds for neural ne networks, they tend to be very loose. Uh, and not, not just numerically, not just that, uh, you know, the numerical factors are uh, wrong or something like that, like even qualitatively, um, in some sense, it doesn't seem to give us uh, the right explanation for why we are able to uh, generalize with neural networks. Um, and in fact, uh, there has been a line of works recently that uh, argue that in some sense, uniform convergence might not even be the appropriate tool to explain why neural networks generalize. Even though it's almost like the only generic approach we have to explain generalization in the learning theory. Um, and uh, there are several arguments along these lines and possible ways to answer them. Um, I'll go a little bit more into detail uh, later on. Uh, but first of all, what are the kind of uniform convergence results we do have for uh, neural networks? Um, and just for simplicity, I'm gonna focus here on depth K networks, which are feed forward. Uh, okay, what's known as, as, as a multi-layer perceptron no skip connection or convolutional layers or anything like that. So the parameters are just the weight matrices W1 till WK. So what kind of uniform convergence? So, so I pick uh, this kind of uh, neural network with certain size of matrices uh, W um, and a certain uh, number K uh, for the depth. What can I uh, say in terms of uniform convergence? So first of all, there are these very generic uniform convergence bounds, which depend on uh, VC dimension bounds. So for those of you who don't know, VC dimension is a certain combinatorial quantity uh, for a predictor class that um, can be used to derive uniform convergence bounds. If the VC dimension is small, then you have good uniform convergence. Um, so you can prove a bound on the VC dimension of this kind of network. And that roughly scales with the overall number of parameters in the network. Uh, however, that's not probably not a very good uh, theory to explain why we generalize in neural networks because in practice, the networks are not small. They tend to be very large and the larger you make them, the better seems to be the performance and the better seems to be the generalization. So, uh, you know, based on these, uh, um, just like VC dimension theory, we would argue that you pick a network that is too large, you would overfit, but this doesn't seem to be the case. Um, okay, so we don't have just VC dimension bounds. We also have all kinds of other uh, tools in our uh, arsenal, sometimes called, called scale sensitive bounds. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the technical details, but roughly speaking, instead of, depending on the number of the parameters that depend on the size of the weights, um, which might be a more a reasonable approach. So, you know, it, it might be fine to have a huge, huge number of parameter, parameters, but as long as the parameters are not too large in some sense, then uh, we should be able to generalize. So that might accord a bit more with practice. The problem that we have here is that um, we don't, there is no consensus yet on what is like the right way to measure the size of the weights because it's not just one number, it's uh, many numbers across several matrices. Um, and once you have many numbers, you want to look maybe at some norm of these matrices, but it's not clear what kind of norm. Um, you know, there are many norms you can define spectral norm, Frobenius norm, Shapin norms, um, and you can get various results with various dependencies of these norms, but it's not yet clear what is the right uh, measure. Um, and- well, also can, again, can I have a question? Yes, of course. Sorry for this, maybe it's basic, but what do you mean by uniform convergence? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, I'll go back once, uh, two slides. So uniform convergence is a phenomenon. When you, when you look at a certain class of predictors, where um, the training error and the test error 
are going to be more or less the same, no matter what predictor you try. So for example, fixed neural network architecture. So my predictor class might be um, uh, all possible ways to choose the weights. So every choice of the weights corresponds to a different uh, network. So uniform convergence would be uh, a situation where no matter what weights you try, the train error and test error of the network, they're going to be similar. If you have this property, and, and you have to work hard usually to prove this property, but if you have this property, then that justifies just minimizing the training error and um, because uniform convergence will ensure that your test error is also going to be um, nearly minimal, okay? So, uh, um, and there are various ways in learning theory to prove these uniform convergence. So these are basically numerical bounds on the equation here on how large can be the difference between the training error and the test error. Uh, and you want this to be small. And the problem is that uh, most of the bounds that we have are in some sense too large. Like either they depend on the number of parameters, which is obviously not what you want to get, or they depend on the size of, of the weights, but in um, like a weird way, either a way that is not clear if it's the right way to measure the size of the weights or not. Um, and also just in terms of the size of the weights, like you have existing bounds, which uh, depend on something like the product of the spectral norms of the matrices uh, across the layers, uh, which is generally exponential in the, in the depth. Uh, but so, so, you know, this would seem to suggest that deep networks uh, should not work, that uh, they should uh, overfit horribly. And this does not seem to be uh, uh, the case. In practice, depth is not that uh, harmful. And this is like an aspect that these kinds of uniform convergence bounds um, still are not very uh, good. I mean, th there's a lot of work about it and uh, improvements, but as of now, this is still a certain obstacle that um, we need to overcome. We know that these kinds of product of norm dependencies are necessary in some worst case sense, but uh, uh, but, but it doesn't ref reflect uh, practice. And like, we still don't quite know how to, uh, to make it uh, happen. Okay, I'm just like describing to you the current uh, uh, situation along uh, this uh, uh, line of uh, work. So there's a lot of progress about it, but I don't think we can say that, you know, as of now we can satisfactorily explain why neural networks uh, work through uniform convergence. Um, uh, moreover, there are these arguments that maybe uniform convergence is not even the right way to explain why neural networks uh, generalize. Um, and uh, just to give you a few examples, so uh, one kind of like one uh, result that uh, made a big splash a few years ago by Jean Vital uh, pointed out that uh, if you take the kind of neural networks that you um, uh, use in practice, uh, so generally they can make the training error go to zero or essentially zero, but it turns out that they can do it not even if you apply it on actual training sets with the true labels, even if you just replace the labels with random labels, like with pure garbage, you can still make the training error uh, go to zero. And this is like a classical situation of overfitting. Like you have data with random labels. So like no learning system will be able to give, to get good test error. Labels are just random, but on the training data, you can get an error of zero. So you have this very large gap between the training error and the test error, which is uh, overfitting. But even though these networks overfit, on practical data sets, they uh, seem to work well. So uh, how come? Um, so actually, that one is not too hard to uh, answer. So um, what one can argue is uh, that there is uh, what is known as what's happening here is what is known in learning theory as structural risk minimization. The bottom line is that I don't care if the neural network can fit a random uh, labels. The point is that on realistic data, the data with the true labels, um, the effective class of predictors you're looking at is not uh, all possible, uh, you know, 
all possible weight combinations, but just those that can are actually likely to be found via a gradient descent. So even though there might be no uniform convergence, if you look at all possible uh, weight combinations, uh, no matter how uh, uh, large, if I look at uh, uh, just the weight combination that you can actually reach by gradient descent and realistic data, it's gonna be a much smaller class. And maybe on that class, there is uniform convergence. Okay, so th there's like a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, classes here. There are those that you actually reach on realistic data, which may be uh, small and have uniform convergence. And uh, okay, you train on weird data with random labels, you probably go beyond this uh, for a class where uniform convergence doesn't hold, but that's not, uh, that's not really a problem. Uh, what I actually care about is what I get on realistic data and there maybe uniform convergence still holds. Is that clear? Again, without, I'm not getting into the details, you know, just trying to give some intuitions here. Um, not really, I didn't really understand what the graph is showing and um, these are all the train losses. Mm -hmm. so that's the train losses. Uh, for the true labels, you get loss of zero eventually. But the point is that even if you just pick random labels, the red line here, eventually you can also make this uh, zero. So, uh, so your, your network, I can make it overfit. I can find weight combinations that uh, even on data where the test error can never be more than a, a constant, I can make the train error go to zero. So there's necessarily a difference between the train error and the test error. Okay, you how do you, you do it with the random labels algorithm? Sorry? How do you do it with the random algorithm? No, it, the random labels. You, you apply, use the same network, a standard uh, training algorithm. It's just that the training data, you replace the real labels with just random labels. And even though it's completely random, there is no statistical relationship between the labels and the inputs, uh, the network uh, still uh, can achieve zero training error. Does it mean that the, the network memorizes examples? Yeah, it, it just memorizes, it's pure memorization. There's no other way you can, uh, you know, make the training error go to zero. You can basically memorize these random labels. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, well, we won't have time to go over uh, everything here, but uh, again, just uh, to, to give like some high level ideas. So there was also like a more serious challenge more recently where uh, by Nagara Khan and Coulter, which argued that uniform convergence in some sense can be unable, is unable to explain transition deep learning even if we focus just on, pre on the predictors likely obtainable uh, by the algorithm. So if you can just look at the predictor class um, of predictors that are actually uh, likely achievable by gradient descent, even there you can uh, create situations where there is a large difference between the test error and the uh, uh, training uh, error. So in some sense uniform convergence uh, doesn't hold. Um, for that as well, there are various uh, 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 responses. So like we created these situations where the training error is large, but the test error is small, but this is not really the situation we usually care about. We're more uh, worried about the reverse situation where the training error seems to be small, but the test error uh, is large. And if you focus just on predictors which achieve a low training error, then uniform convergence does hold in some cases. Uh, there were also some other uh, explanations. Um, so again, I'm not gonna go into the details, just like to um, point out that there is this ongoing debate on you know, whether uniform convergence can explain uh, generalization in deep learning or not. Um, there are also other situations where uh, you might have label noise, so the test error can never be below something, yet uh, predictors that uh, make the, test, the training error zero uh, still work uh, uh, rather well. Um, 
Another related challenge is this uh, phenomenon known as uh, double descent. So uh, many of you took uh, like machine learning 101 probably uh, um, heard about uh, bias uh, variance uh, trade-off or uh, this is this, uh, um, this uh, concept that uh, as you make your predictor class larger and more complex, you can make the training error uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, but at some point you're gonna start overfitting. Uh, and there is this uh, sweet spot where the test uh, error is uh, minimized. Like you wanna pick a predictor class, which is uh, large, but not too large, so you won't overfit. Um, but it turns out in many cases, especially related to um, deep learning, but uh, not only, you have a more complicated behavior. So. Uh, you have a situation where uh, the test error goes down as you make your predictor class more and more complicated. Then it goes up, up to some a, a threshold. And when you continue, then actually it goes down again. Uh, so it, it, sometimes it, actually the best thing to do is to make the uh, complexity of your class very, very large, like much larger than what classical theory uh, would tell you. Um, so uh, regarding this, so first of all, I should point out that it's not really quite new. I mean, there's a lot of excitement around these things in the past two years, but actually the, it's a phenomenon that was observed in other contexts uh, much earlier than that. Um, and the current situation here is that uh, we can't explain why you, why you have this kind of double descent uh, uh, or like not uh, having, uh, not seeing any overfitting um, in various distribution specific settings. So, uh, you know, you look at a linear regression with Gaussian inputs where the input, Gaussian input distribution has a certain structure, then you can show that uh, you get this kind of double descent or uh, this kind of uh, non-overfitting behavior. Uh, the problem is that uh, these are still rather specific. Like we don't know uh, as of now how to show why this happens under kind of general conditions. We, we could just like, you know, isolate specific uh, study cases where we can prove that uh, this thing happens. But we still don't have like a general theory, I think, for um, explaining why this should happen in uh, general. Uh, it's not that the, the a complicating factor here is that it's not really something that always happens, right? There are learning problems which accord with the more classical theory where you have just, you know, a um, test error that goes down and then up without another double descent. Um, but still, it seems that there is this general class of problems which have this behavior that we haven't quite identified yet. Uh, another uh, hot topic related to uh, generalization error, or more precisely the intersection between generalization and optimization is uh, what is known about is as implicit bias. Uh, so there is this thesis that um, even if you don't do any kind of explicit regularization to help you generalize, um, if you just run training algorithms as is, at least the standard ones, you know, gradient methods, uh, their dynamics are such that they lead to networks which automatically tend to uh, generalize. So even though you're not explicitly forcing the learning uh, system to generalize well, the dynamics of the training algorithm automatically ensures that you will. Um, and just to give some examples, so if you look at uh, exponentially paired losses, for example, logistic loss or cross entropy loss. Uh, so for example, if you look at linear predictors without any kind of regularization, we can show that gradient descent would converge to a max margin solution. So, so a predictor which maximizes the margin or the distance from the training examples, which is a situation where we know very well that uh, generalization uh, occurs. Um, and uh, this, and, and the results of similar flavor has also been shown for neural networks. So for example, networks that sort of satisfy a certain homogeneity property, think about ReLU networks, for example, uh, they converge to um, not necessarily the, the optimum of the max margin optimization problem, but 
what is known as a KKT point. So you can think of it very roughly as some kind of a, a local optimum of uh, the problem or a, something at least that you would hope would be a decent uh, a minimizer of this max margin optimization problem. Uh, for squared loss, the thing situation is a little bit uh, trickier. So linear predictors converge to a minimum norm solution in general. Which again, we know uh, we have good explanations why a minimum norm solution will generalize. Um, in the context of linear of uh, deep networks, uh, there have been it's really ongoing work. So like in deep linear networks could be that in some sense you uh, converge to a solution which minimizes some kind of rank, uh, could be something else. Uh, on the other hand, there are also impossibility results. Uh, so for example, if, even if you look at single relus and the squared loss, you cannot really characterize their implicit bias, although you can characterize them approximately. Uh, again, I'm not going into any details, just you know, giving you some high-level uh, points. OK, uh, any questions about generalization error before I move to optimization error? OK, so optimization error, as I said earlier, uh, refers to this issue that you know, I give you some training set, I give you some network, and you want to find a weight combination that minimizes er error even just on that training set. And the challenge here is that, in general, this is a non-convex problem in the weights. A non-convex function cannot be optimized in general. So if I look at the optimization landscape, how this function looks as a function of theta um, of the weight parameters. So it doesn't look like you know, some goal with you know, one uh, nice uh, global optimum. It looks more like a, a complicated mountain range when you have valleys and you can get stuck at uh, local, locally optimal, uh, like bad uh, local minima, which are not uh, global uh, minima. Uh, however, a very simple local search method, basically gradient descent, um, seem to learn these uh, networks uh, quite well. And the big question here is why? Why, despite the non-complexity of the problem, we manage to train these networks? Um, and there is a lot of, many, many works uh, along these lines. If I maybe roughly try to cut categorize them uh, to two categories, I can say the following. So first of all, there are positive convergence guarantees to a global optimum for non-convex problems if you're willing to uh, assume a lot of structure. Like you take a very structured non-convex problem, for example, principal component analysis or phase retrieval, or if you try to learn a single neuron. So for these problems, we can show uh, pretty good results that you Gradient descent will converge to a global optimum in general. Um, but of course, this is still nowhere near practical state of the art neural networks. Um, there are also kind of generic conditions that ensure convergence to a global optimum, even though you have non convexity. So you can talk about uh, stuff like one point convexity or uh, what's known as a PL condition. I'm not going into the detail, but so, so these are situations where you can still show convergence to global in minimum, but uh, you need a lot of structure to ensure that these uh, conditions hold. Alternatively, uh, you also have results that uh, work without any structural assumptions, uh, but they don't guarantee convergence to a global op optimum or even a local optimum. They just guarantee convergence to, uh, say, a stationary point. A, or a second order stationary point. So these are points where the gradient is basically zero and the Hessian, the second derivative is a positive semi-definite, um, which is a necessary condition for uh, optimality, but it, it's not a sufficient condition. Uh, but you can argue in many cases, if you converge to such stationary points, you do converge to a global optimum. So let's focus just on the convergence to such uh, stationary points. And if that's your goal, you can actually prove very uh, general uh, results for you know, simple gradient-based methods. Um, besides, these are also results in which um, 
don't really talk about the convergence of some algorithm, but more about <clears throat> geometric properties of the uh, optimization landscape. So for example, maybe under certain conditions, every local minimum is a global, a, or maybe any local minimum is not too bad. Uh, so it doesn't say anything directly about the optimization algorithm, but it still says that the optimization landscape, the geometry is uh, benign in some sense. Um, the challenge here is that um, everything here gets complicated uh, very quickly. So if you try to show these results for um, practical neural networks, we're still nowhere near being able to uh, do that, only on much, much uh, simpler uh, problems. So uh, if you do want kind of an approach that would scale to, uh, um, to large neural networks, uh, maybe the most successful approach so far is what is known as overparameterization. So the idea here is that you focus on purpose on um, very, 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 very large uh, networks with many, many parameters, which of course with practice, and argue that actually taking networks which are very, very large makes the optimization problem simpler. Uh, why is that? So the intuition is that if you have many parameters, it means that your optimization problem lives in a very high dimensional space. Uh, one that, uh, because right, the number of dimensions is the number of parameters. In very high dimensions, maybe it's harder for local search algorithms to get stuck uh, in some local optimum because there are so many directions in which you can try to continue decrease that it would be hard to get to a point where you'll get stuck in all uh, directions. Uh, this is, of course, it's not anything rigorous, just hand waving, but maybe kind of possible intuition. Uh, and, and this is also something that you can see in practice. So, like, just to give one uh, early example of this. Uh, so this is a situation where the authors uh, took data, which was actually generated by a uh, certain network with depth two and uh, width 60. And then they trained on this data using a network which had um, larger width, had more neurons. So this is a, a network that by design always have a weight combination where the uh, training error is zero that was generated by a network of this architecture. Uh, however, if you look at the blue line, so it's, this corresponds to a situation where the network has the same architecture as the network that generated the data. Um, so you get some error, but not too bad. It kind of uh, flattens out uh, pretty early. It doesn't seem to go to zero. However, if you increase the size of the network, for example, look at the green line. So this is where you train a network eight times larger than the network that generated the data, then actually the training error goes to zero uh, very quickly. Okay, so uh, can I explain again why uh, why the error uh, of the network that generated this data is not zero? Did we take the same architecture but like some uh, initialized with uh, other yeah, weights? So we we chose a network, we use it to to label the data. Then we forgot about this network and we just ran a, a stochastic gradient descent with random initialization. Okay, so uh, with a network of the same architecture, uh, a stochastic gradient descent was not able to find the, the weight combination with zero error, even though there exists such a weight combination. But by making the network larger, uh, you are able to uh, get a zero error empirically, okay? Um, and, and this is something that was observed also in other situations. Um, okay, I won't get into the details, but uh, you know, situations where you can see that making the network that you turn on just a little bit larger dramatically improves its probability of finding a global optimum. And uh, can, can we show this, can, can we prove that this thing works, uh, you know, in general? And uh, the answer is yes, in the following sense. So if the networks are sufficiently overparameterized, allow them to be su uh, sufficiently large, it's possible to show that the optimization dynamics essentially behave 
as if you're solving a convex problem. So which convex problem? Uh, of basically learning linear predictors over a certain fixed nonlinear mapping of the data. Uh, but you're training a linear predictor, so the problem is essentially complex and gradient methods uh, do work. Uh, and there are various ways to formalize this depending on scalings and details of the architecture. Uh, so one, for example, is known as the neural tangent kernel, uh, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more later on, but there are also other ways like mean field and um, other stuff. Um, Okay, so what's the intuition of the neural tangent kernel, just briefly? So let's consider just training a depth through network uh, in, with respect to just the first layer. Okay, so I have a network which has this architecture um, and I fix the UIs uh, randomly and I just train over the WIs with respect to some training data. So standard to, uh, way to initialize, pick the UIs so that they scale as roughly one over square root of n. Like we do Xavier initialization, that's how we should pick the UIs. And uh, what does that mean? So if I look now at the gradient with respect to any particular WI, so this WI gets multiplied by something like one over square root of n, which means that the gradient with respect to WI scales like one over square root of n. So that means that the gradient with respect to any particular wi gets smaller and smaller as a n, the number of neurons, increase. Essentially, what this means is that when n is large enough, the gradient steps initially will keep wi very close to uh, its random initialization. OK, so the, each individual wi almost won't move uh, initially. And that justifies uh, replacing this network by a first order Taylor expansion. So if each WI remains very close to its initialization, it means that the network that I express is very similar to the network at the random initialization, plus some linear term, which depends on the gradient of the network at the initialization, at a W0. Uh, and when you look at it a little bit, you realize that this thing is really just a linear predictor. Okay, with respect to W, it's linear in W because it gets, it's just an inner product of W uh, with uh, you know, some kind of gradient that depends on X and the initialization, but it doesn't depend on W. Uh, plus some other thing, other stuff that does not depend on uh, W. So what you end up with is a, basically a linear predictor on top of some complicated nonlinear random feature mapping, which is specified by the gradient. Okay. Um, so um, again, without going into the details, the idea here is that if you make the weight large enough and you don't do too many iterations, the dynamics behave almost as if you just trained a linear predictor on top of some uh, feature mapping, which another way to think about it is that you learn a kernel predictor with respect to a kernel which is specified by these uh, gradients. And kernel learning is something that we can prove that gradient methods uh, work on and they converge to a global uh, optimum. So when you run gradient methods here, uh, you basically converge fast to an optimal kernel solution while still in the kernel regime. Okay, so you converge while still uh, doing not too many iterations, so still the network behaves like this uh, kernel predictor. Okay, and this is a pretty uh, generic framework. You can apply it on very ge uh, generic uh, architectures. Um, uh, so whenever the parameters you can show don't move too far from their initialization, um, you can show this thing works. And at least in terms of the training error, you get um, a good uh, performance. Okay, and uh, this is kind of a random kernel because it depends on the random initialization. But again, if the network is large enough, it converges to some uh, fixed uh, kernel. And that's the neural tangent kernel uh, that appears a lot in the literature. Um, 
And in fact, uh, this is really just a very special case of like a very old idea in, uh, in uh, machine learning, which is known as learning with random features. So, so basically what did we do here? So um, we uh, showed that what uh, essentially we learned here is the network is large enough is uh, some linear predictor composed with a certain uh, random nonlinear uh, mapping. Okay, and th this is like a very old idea. It actually goes back uh, even to the perceptual machine from the 1950s. Uh, I guess many of you uh, learned about the perception algorithm uh, in the machine learning course, but actually the percept original perception was an algorithm, it was a machine, this machine. Uh, built in Cornell in the 1950s, and it was essentially a linear predictor on top of a bunch of uh, uh, random uh, connections, basically random uh, features. And um, so essentially this kind of neural tangent approach can explain why we learn whenever we can learn with uh, random features. Um, and they are good, they are good in a certain sense, so I can show that you know, with sufficient overparameterization with enough random features, you can basically train the network to learn uh, anything. Um, but it's also important to realize that um, the, the point is that's sufficient. So the question is how much overparameterization you need. Um, and uh, I guess I'm starting to uh, run a little bit out of time, but um, uh, maybe I'll just finish with, with this uh, 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 with this point. So, um, what can we learn with these kind of random feature approaches? Uh, so, at least we want to be able to learn uh, stuff that is induced by simple networks. So, let's look at a particular easy case, which is a single ReLU neuron. Okay, which we know is learnable with standard, uh, you know, with uh, SGD, um, and we can ask can these kind of neural tangent kernel approaches, can these random feature approaches explain learnability of single relevant neurons? So again, we know this is a case where SGD works. If you try to train a single neuron um, to learn you know, some other target a neuron with respect to data you know, sampled from a Gaussian, uh, you can do that. But uh, let's suppose we don't know that and we want to explain why we can learn uh, single row neurons uh, using a uh, random features. Um, and it turns out that you cannot use random features um, to learn relu neurons um, in the following uh, sense. So again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but bottom line is that take any kind of random feature approach, take any kind of uh, neural tangent kernel uh, you want, uh, unless the number of uh, neurons that you use um, or the number of random features you use, unless it's exponential in the dimension, you won't be able to express uh, arbitrary uh, ReLU neurons uh, in general, okay? So, uh, so, so it's not that, Something like neural tangent kernel can't uh, explain uh, uh, learning relevant neurons, but the amount of overspecification you need would be ridiculously large. It would be exponential in the uh, input uh, dimension, which does not correspond to practice. In practice, we can learn a single relevant neuron even with just like one neuron. We don't need exponentially many neurons. Um, so uh, you can say that this is a scientific theory. Random features can't explain uh, the ability of uh, um, even small uh, networks or even of uh, single neurons. And uh, when you think about it, it's kind of intuitive because uh, like the whole way these approaches work is to argue that uh, you look at situations where the network is kind of fixed that it's random initialization and you just play with the uh, weights on top. You just learn a linear a predictor on top of some fixed nonlinear mapping. And that kind of ignores the whole representation learning aspect of deep learning, right? Like the whole point of deep learning that you have many layers and uh, the internal layers can adapt a, and, and kind of learn the appropriate way to represent uh, the data in a way that is useful for the 
layers on top and um, random feature or neural tangent kernel approaches kind of ignore this uh, whole thing. Look at a regime where in some sense all of the layers are frozen. Um, so it's useful for some things, but it doesn't really capture the presentation learning aspect or uh, the practical dynamics that we see on a reasonably sized uh, neural networks. Um, so a lot of current research is uh, trying to show similar uh, positive results, but not for networks which are hugely overparameterized, but uh, networks which are more moderately uh, overparameterized. But then it's no longer it, it no longer behaves like a kernel or a random feature, so uh, things get uh, more complicated. Um, and I won't have time to talk about uh, the proof ideas, unfortunately, but uh, you know, feel free to look at the slides uh, later on. Uh, okay, so um, just to summarize the optimization uh, uh, part of the uh, lecture. So again, the big question here is how come we can successfully train uh, neural networks with central gradient based uh, methods? So on one hand, overparameterization seems to be a key piece. So making the network larger than what you would need um, in order to find to, to have a good predictor seems to help, both uh, in practice and in many, many experiments where people observe that um, making the network larger uh, helps. And also definitely state-of-the-art networks are very large and it seems to help optimization. Uh, we can also explain this in theory, but um, in a partial way. So if the uh, uh, overparameterization is sufficiently large, then uh, things behave like a linear predictor uh, on top of the nonlinear mapping, and then we can prove things work. But the amount of overparameterization um, is generally huge. So there is a lot of uh, interest nowadays in uh, trying to show positive results for optimization, even when the networks are not that grossly overparameterized and where they don't, do behave differently than um, random uh, features. Okay, because otherwise we, we can't really explain even learnability of uh, single neurons. So uh, any questions about uh, this part of the talk? Okay, um, so that uh, basically concludes uh, uh, the lecture. Uh, so again, I only talked about, I just like kind of gave you a few vignettes of the kind of ongoing research that uh, is going uh, on and you know, only at a, a high level, there is much more than what I can uh, put into uh, one uh, lecture, but uh, Again, roughly speaking, we still uh, have many, many things we don't understand about the uh, theory of uh, deep learning, but progress is being uh, slowly made, uh, both in terms of uh, expressiveness, what kind of functions can networks express, and what kind of architectures you need in order to express them. In terms of generalization, um, how come neural networks uh, uh, generalize uh, uh, well? And how is it connected, for example, to the kind of algorithms that uh, we use to uh, train them? And finally, just in terms of the optimization error, how come we uh, manage to get uh, very small training errors on a very non-convex problem with simple methods? Um, and uh, you know, what kind of principles might be used in order to uh, explain that? So that's it. Thank you very much.